Hello and welcome to the June edition of the William Selium webinar. Uh, my name is Carly Dupuy, and I'm so excited to welcome everyone to joining us, whether it be on Facebook or on YouTube. And I'm extra excited about the topic that we're going to be co covering today. Uh, this is going to be our Cabernet Sauvignon overview and kind of taking a, a look into our philosophy as a winery and how we how we apply our, our winemaking techniques to Cabernet. Um, I also want to introduce a couple of my fellow co-workers who will be joining me today. We have uh, we have Mark, who is our head of sales, uh, excuse me, director of sales, Mark Malpedi, and Jeff Lingahas, our uh, vice president and director of winemaking. Hey, guys. Wonderful. Before we get started, I just wanted to kind of, again, extend a welcome to everyone and to let you know, if you don't already have wine in front of you, please pour yourself a glass make yourself comfortable, and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, but first things first, I know we have some folks out there who enjoy our trivia questions. So it is trivia time. The hey, trivia Carl, before you ask your trivia question, um, I'm not sure if comments are turned on. So just yeah, a little- we'll That is a great question. On. Let me go we'll ahead and- to Answer the question when we ask it. <laughs> of course. Oops. There we go. There we go. Perfect. All right. Hello, everyone. That's better. <laughs> so the trivia question for this month and the winner of this trivia question gets a vintage William Selium, or excuse me, vintage style William Selium corduroy logoed hat, which is very exciting. We actually based the design off of one that uh, Burt Williams used to wear. So it's kind of a, a fun, fun treat. The trivia question is, can you name five varietals that William Selium produces? And if anyone can get that, they will be the lucky winner of a beautiful logoed William Selium hat. So if you feel free to drop your answers in the comments and we'll go ahead and uh, reach out to you afterwards uh, and send along that hat. Thank you, thank you. Cool. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic off to Mark who's going to start us off with the discussion, Mark. All right, and Pete by in already and he, he went for six. Um, and you know, uh, I think we actually make eight or nine. Um, uh, so, you know, we have a interesting history with Cabernet. It might seem like a little bit of a disconnect for a Pinot Noir producer in Sonoma County to make a Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. But if you think about all the different varieties that we make, um, and now that we have uh, a answers in the, the box, you know, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Zinfandel, Port, Late Harvest Gewurztraminer, Chenin Blanc, Gruner Veltliner, Cabernet. So we've, and in the past, um, we made a Muscat Canelli. We made a, a Late Harvest Botrytis wine. Um, so we have always had a history of looking at different varieties and seeing if we could put the William Selium stamp on it. And so in 2008, okay, port isn't a variety, that's true. <laughs> we make a port of five different uh, grape varieties that are traditional in the port region. Um, I love that you, you guys are keeping me honest. Um, we started looking into Cabernet Sauvignon uh, back when Bob Cabral was our winemaker in the mid-2000s. And um, we actually made our first one in 2007, um, didn't release it, um, but we experimented with it for a while. Uh, and then in 2008, we made one from a vineyard called Haystack Peak out in kind of the southeastern part of Napa Valley. Um, and the wine actually turned out great. Right when we were making it, is right when the 2008 kind of housing and finance collapse went in and we just decided, you know what, probably now's not the time to do something uh, this outside of our uh, everyday wheelhouse. So we shelved the project. And by the way, that Haystack Peak, if anybody out there still has some bottles of it, it's drinking beautifully right now. Um, it's a it's a slightly different style than the newer wines, you know, obviously different vineyards, but it is, um, it is a great example of Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley. Um, when this came up again, 
uh, and we started looking at it, we decided we wanted to uh, find a vineyard that would be as iconic for Cabernet Sauvignon as Rocchioli or the Allen Vineyard or Precious Mountain would be for Pinot Noir. And the uh, obvious choice was uh, one of the Beckstoffer vineyards. And so Jeff went over and spoke to Andy Beckstoffer and was able to um, convince him, I don't think it was very hard, that we'd be a good partner for a Sonoma County Pinot Noir producer to make a different style of Napa Valley cap. So 2016 was uh, our first vintage and uh, we're in the, uh, we've pretty much sold out of the 2018 as of today. Uh, I thought we'd have a little more um, coming into this webinar, but we sold a little more than I expected today. Um, and I want to just talk about some of the kind of uh, housekeeping about how we sell the Cabernet because I'm sure we'll get questions of it before I turn it over to Jeff. Um, you know, we don't send the Cabernet offer out to everyone. It is not a popularity contest or anything like that. We make just a little amount of it. And so instead of sending it to the whole list and having it sell out very, very quickly, we just send it out to people in small waves because, and those are the people who have raised their hand at some point through one mechanism or another and told us that they are interested in Cabernet. So um, if you are interested in some, we do have a few bottles left, just throw the information in the chat or email, um, email us at, um, at uh, contact at William Selliam and we'll do our best to get you a bottle, but we can certainly put you on the list to get the offer on our next release. Um, and so that, that's basically how we do it. We, uh, we always sell it around the June timeframe and then we, uh, we ship it in the fall and we do our best to ship it with the fall release depending on where you are. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jeff Mangahas to talk to you about how we go about uh, thinking about CAB, how we make it and start talking about the wine. So Jeff, why don't you jump in here and talk about some of the more interesting aspects of this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great to be here with you guys discussing the um, the Cabernet. Um, yeah, as Mark said, 2016 was our very first vintage. And um, it's interesting because when I first got into wine, I, I've always been a, a Pinot Noir lover, uh, but some of my very first um, interests were Bordeaux and it's kind of come full circle because here I am today making not only great Pinot Noirs, but incredible Cabernets as well. And hopefully some of you will get a chance to, to, to taste them um, as, as time goes on. Um, you know, a, a, a lot like with our por portfolio of Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays, they're about the place. And, you know, kind of as Mark alluded to, you know, we wanted vineyards of distinction and, and, and unique qualities and, and so it was sort of a natural match, perfect match to, to kind of approach the next offers to, to find, you know, get some of their fruit and make some of these really distinctive, uh, unique site specific wines. And the very first vintage, 2016, uh, we started sourcing uh, from the George III vineyard, which is a, a historic vineyard on the Silverado Trail. So if you're familiar with, with uh, Rutherford, uh, Rutherford kind of spans uh, both sides of uh, Highway 29. Uh, George III is a, a historic uh, vineyard that, you know, used to go into um, uh, Bulow Vineyards, uh, George uh, de la Tour uh, bottling, uh, which was always to me known as, you know, very elegant, you know, that that sort of Rutherford uh, clay gravelly kind of soil always delivered, um, you know, an elegant wine. And I think the, the old, if you ever get a chance to try some of those older uh, Georgia Latour uh, bottlings, they're actually still terrific. Um, and so I was kind of excited when, uh, you know, first getting a chance to play around with the George III because as a Pinot Noir winemaker, elegance, I mean, as you guys know, our wines are about elegance and texture. And I kind of felt like the Rutherford sort of dust and, um, you know, kind of translated or would translate very well into our style um, as, as a Pinot Noir, known as a Pinot Noir house. Um, so yeah, 2016 was our first year. Um, 
I've been working every, you know, ever since then, we've been working with, um, uh, with, uh, uh, this vineyard over the years have attained a few more blocks, uh, here and there, uh, different soil types, different rootstocks, different clonal material. Um, and interestingly enough, I mean, even with a lot of our Pinot Noirs, even though they're single vineyard wines, uh, they're often blends of multiple sections within a vineyard. So Rocchioli, for example, uh, Allen, there are multiple sections of the vineyard. And, and so they're sort of like mini blends. And what I appreciate about that is the, the dynamic nature of something on a hillside versus in the, in the flat, they contribute something different, but together they really make something uh, more harmonious. Um, and, you know, I think our Russian River Pinot Noir blend is really outstanding for, for that reason uh, as well. So over the years, we've acquired a few more blocks within George, um, and it's really kind of fleshing the wine out. So, um, yeah, the 16, uh, super delicious wine, our very first effort, um, you know, has a lot of red fruit character, uh, elegance, and, and that sort of thing. Um, it's not only just the site, though. I mean, a lot of the, I think, elegance that's sort of built into uh, the wine is, you know, taking a page out of our, our Pinot Noir winemaking book, right? So uh, for those of you that have visited or really know about how we make the wine here, um, you know, we, we make them in the horizontal open top dairy tanks, right? So, um, and just like with the Pinot Noirs, we do foot treading and things like that. So that type of extraction. So if you can imagine typical Cabernet winemaking is done in an open top upright tank, uh, and you're pumping over the the the, the must uh, uh, the the grapes during the fermentation process to get the extraction, but when you turn that sort of on its side and have an open top uh, horizontal tank, you really have a, a better ratio of the skin to the juice. We do some pump over, tiny tiny little bit, uh, but most of it is just foot treading like we would with the Pinot Noir. Um, and, um, you know, some punch downs with, uh, with a hand tool. Um, and so the net effect is that we're getting gentle extraction. I think that really does contribute to the overall style, uh, that hopefully you'll be able to taste in the glass. Um, we do a little bit of extended maceration, not much, you know, maybe 12 or 15 days tasting the wine every day, deciding when it's the perfect time to, uh, to extract, uh, or uh, press the grapes. Um, and, you know, typically, you know, again, in a traditional sort of Cabernet winemaking style, it's pump over, beat it up, get as much extraction as possible. And I want to get as much extraction as possible in, in, in our fermentation, but we're doing it, uh, you know, we're punching it down or foot treading it up to four times a day. So we're doing it frequently and possibly, you know, compared to other houses, maybe a shorter period of time. But the real difference is that laying out the grapes in a, in a, a wider surface area is really helping to um, maximize the extraction. So it's the same concept, but doing it in a slightly different way. Um, and I feel like, I mean, when you look at the, you know, when you look at the grapes at the end of the extraction, you can tell when the color has been fully uh, and the tannins have been fully extracted from the grapes. They look very pale. Um, so we know that we're getting out as much as possible. Um, and that little bit of extended maceration. So that means after the fermentation's done, we actually close the tank up, seal it up, and just sort of let it stew in its skins uh, for that 12 or 14 days. And that's getting a little bit more extraction, sort of passively getting a little bit more extraction out of the uh, out of the grapes, um, and then and then press it off um, uh, right when I feel like the tannins are starting to come together. So largely not that different from our from our Pinot Noir winemaking, although in Cabernet, we, we're, we're, we're super careful to not include any whole cluster like we would with Pinot Noir. The vegetal character of, of the stems are, are, are a problem uh, for, the, for the flavor and the, and the palate. Uh, so everything's whole berry. Um, but we're, I feel like we're getting all the extraction that we want, right, out of, uh, out of the grapes uh, at that point. Um, Moving into to how the wine gets aged, um, because we've done a great job at the fermenter extracting exactly what we want, um, we really only have to rack the wines a couple of times. Um, 
before bottling. So um, the real purpose in racking a wine is to help start the polymerization and the softening of tannins. So if you've over extracted the wine or you feel like you've extracted it too much, you want to rack it very frequently to start to bring the tannins together. Since we've done a better job or a, a, a great job of extracting of what just what we want, um, racking is not necessary to, to help soften the wine because it's already softer. Um, so yeah, even, you know, we have three glasses that we're going to, three vintages that we're going to taste and arguably, even though the 18, which is just, was just released is big and strong, it still has a real elegance to it. And that owes to, to how we make the wine, uh, unfined, unfiltered, um, aged for about 19 months. Uh, and surprisingly, all these wines actually, uh, all the Cabernet is aged in a hundred percent new French oak. Um, you wouldn't know it. The, the wines just, there's such density with the wines that they kind of soak up that oak character very readily. Um, and, you know, while adding a, a supporting role to the, to the overall kind of texture of the wine. Um, that's sort of the winemaking uh, in, 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 uh, in a nutshell. Um, it's actually super simple uh, in that regard. No fining. Um, you know, that's, a, that's typically, you know, I'd say a typical sort of technique. You've extracted too much, you know, if you've extracted too much during the fermentation, uh, oftentimes you need to fine the wines in order to take some of the tannin out. So, um, you know, looking at all this through, you know, a Pinot Noir um, sort of lens, Pinot Noir is very difficult. You need to extract just the right amount uh, to bring the best out of the wine. And, and I feel like taking that sort of technique or that concept and applying it to Pinot Noir is a super successful formula. And it's, um, these wines are absolutely delicious. Um, so let's jump into the to tasting of the 2016. Um, any questions, uh, Mark or, or, or Carly? Did I hopefully explain that well enough? I have one question, Jeff. Um, yeah. So the uh, what barrels are you using for this? I, I'm assuming we're, n we're not using Francois Frere like we do with the Pinot. So which, which Cooper are we using? Yeah, so there's a couple of traditional um, uh, Bordelais type barrels, uh, primarily Terenceau, uh, which is a classic uh, Cabernet barrel. Um, we're using a few other Coopers that I'm experimenting with. Uh, lately, there's uh, one called Darnajou, uh, which is brings a lot of sweetness and, and richness to the, to the palate. Uh, but it's largely Terran so that's that's been um, uh, kind of the backbone. And a percentage of these barrels, uh, the Terran so's are interesting because they're what's called T5, uh, which are um, so when the trees are cut down in France, um, they're aged, you know, like our Pinot Noir barrels are aged for a minimum of three years before they're made and they're crafted into a barrel and toasted and, and that sort of thing. The T5 is actually aged for five years. Uh, crazy five years as wood staves out in the yard and um, uh, at Terran so before it's crafted into a barrel. So it really does bring, you know, the longer you age the wood out in the field, it's experiencing the, you know, the sun, the rain, the snow, the sleet and all that stuff. And it's helping to soften the wood from a tannic perspective. So you get just the right level of soft tannins, which is a perfect match for, for Cabernet uh, in general. So uh, a little overkill for Pinot Noir. Um, I have tried it on Pinot Noir just for fun. Uh, it makes a really great wine, but um, Cabernet, it's, it's just perfect, uh, this T5 barrel. So I'm, I'm really impressed with the kind of the red fruited nature of this yeah. um, color and taste. I mean, it, it, it's definitely, I feel like it's a Cabernet made by a Pinot Noir maker, right? Yeah. It's, it's elegant, it's soft, it's very drinkable now. Um, it it I, definitely still, you know, it has that, um, you know, what, what I love about what we're doing, it, it has that signature of Cabernet, right? So Cabernet yeah. can be, you know, there's the spectrum of red fruits and, you know, super dark blackberry, boysenberry type fruits, but... You know, these wines all have an element of, and it's inherent in the variety, right? Which is, you know, like a tobacco or a cedar, a cedar box, that kind of thing. And, and that element's in there. 
Um, and, you know, growing up on Bordeaux, um, you know, that's something that, that I've always equated with a, a Cabernet, right. Or a Cabernet based blend. Uh, so it's, it's a pleasure to see that this site's really incredible. I mean, the, the George site is, is, uh, it's dynamic. There's lots of different soil profiles. Uh, yeah, there's a picture of it. Um, you know, it's got some gravelly kind of beds, um, uh, sections of, you know, with some clay and it is, you know, loamy kind of soils. So it's kind of perfect for the long ripening cycle, uh, enough water holding capacity, uh, in the soil. Um, so it, it fully ripens. It's in a nice warm spot in Rutherford. So it doesn't, you know, it kind of burns off some of those, um, there is the propensity for overly vigorous Cabernet sites to, to deliver, you know, like a, a real bell pepper kind of pyrazine, what's called a pyrazine. Uh, and this site doesn't have any of that character. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty magical. Um, you know, this particular, the 2016 was, it was our first wine, right? And, you know, we got a couple of blocks. I was super excited to, to, to start making Cabernet just, I mean, I'm a lover of wine in general, but it it, it was uh, uh, cool to apply what what I know and what we know as a Pinot Noir house uh, to making something different. And I think the results are super successful. Um, yeah, super Carly, what do you think of the wine? I am a huge fan of this particular vintage of the the George Latour or George the Third uh, Cabernet. Just absolutely stunning. I think magical, Jeff. That was a that was a good. Uh, descriptor of this vineyard. I've, I've always been very fond of this particular vineyard from other producers and maybe this is my bias, but I, I really do enjoy this this rendition of it. It's just has this elegance that I've, I don't think I've found in another Cabernet like this. And I think we touched on this earlier, you know, being a, a winemaker with a, a Pinot Noir lens focused on Cabernet, I think is such a fascinating thing. And, and you can really tell this, this is, you know, a Pinot Noir lover's Cabernet. It, 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 there's there's a finesse to it that you you don't often yeah. see, and it's not quite as you know tannic, kind of overwhelming tannins. There's there's that softness that you would not expect from from yeah. this, this wine. And well, what's interesting, I think um, the reason why people age Cabernet, you know, 10, 20 years, it's because there's a lot of extraction, right, in those wines, and that's not to say that that's wrong. Um, but, you know, making the way that we, making the wine the way that we do kind of tames those tannins a little bit more. So it does bring the wine into the, to the fold a little bit earlier. Right. So, I mean, who would think drinking a 2016 today? And I think it's really quite supple, you know, it could still go for years, uh, should you decide. Um, but yeah, I mean, coupled with, I mean, these three vintages, uh, sorry, I'm looking down at my glasses uh, as I'm talking here, but the 16, 17, and 18 were, were very good vintages, actually. I shouldn't say good. They were great vintages from a growing season perspective. Um, you know, 16 was, you know, a little bit on the cool side. We had average sort of rainfall, um, but, you know, late September, I remember we were already done, well done with the Pinot Noir harvest in 16 uh, by the end of September just kind of waiting for the cab. And then we got a couple of days of near a hundred degrees uh, in Rutherford and it just kind of pushed everything to the uh, kind of to the brink of, of being ready. And then I'm looking down, um, picked the Cabernet in 16 on September 27th, um, which the typical harvest, you know, probably is late September, early October. Um, and, yeah, I thought the grapes were were just perfect um, and pulled the trigger. So, yeah, super um, concentrated wine, uh, elegant, uh, drinkable, and decidedly Cabernet. So, well done. Love Great it. Vintage. Love it. Yeah. Um, should we move on to the seventeen, or do you guys want to? You want to do? Uh, want to take a little? We'll do the Carly's hot seat. Yeah, let's do Carly's hot seat. I think mm -hmm. it's time for hot seat questions. All right. So and Mark, I one, understand you're going to be putting the one putting me in the hot seat today. Exactly. Finally, finally get to turn this around on you, Carly. Um, okay. Just got a few questions for you. Uh, first one is, 
What is your most memorable meal or food experience? Mm. Ooh, that's a good question. I, I have to say probably my most memorable food experience was actually at a tiny little Italian restaurant in Paris. I, I used to live in France when I was in, in college and I remember it was a super rainy day and my, my you know, uh, partner at the time stumbled upon a, a little restaurant. It was pouring down rain. We were right on the bank of the, the, um, the Canal Saint-Martin where if you're familiar, that's where Amelie spends a lot of her time from the movie. <laughs> really beautiful neighborhood. And I remember we came in early cause you know, in Europe they eat dinner so late in the evening and we got there at like five o'clock or something and they weren't even open, <laughs> but they were so kind and so sweet. And they said, you know what, come on in. We'll make you a fresh cup of coffee. And uh, they ended up making us Bellinis where the, the, the bartender, you know, took the white peach and, and squeezed it from his hand instead of, you know, instead of uh, just using, you know, canned juice or something. And we just had the most amazing food and wine pairing with some of the most beautiful French and Italian wines. So I, I my bias is towards William Salian, but also towards, uh, I do have a special place in my heart for, for, uh, for French wines in particular, having spent time there. So cool. I think that it's a, it's awesome. a tiny little place called Canaletto's on the, the, the bank of the Canal Saint-Martin in Paris. Awesome. Cool. Okay. What's the strangest place you've drunk wine? The strangest place I've drunk wine. <laughs> That's a really good question, actually. Trying um, to throw curveballs. <laughs> throwing me curveballs? I know, because I caught you last time on a couple. Yeah. Ooh, strangest place I've drank wine. Um, I mean, I wouldn't call it strange, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of a, a good picnic out on the coast. And because, you know, wine glasses are few and far between, at least in my car, I ended up drinking wine out of a out of a mason jar when I when I was out at the coast because I just so happened to have it in my in my car at the time. I'm trying to think of a stranger place, but that's that's a strange thing to be drinking out of. Okay. It's okay. definitely an odd experience, but nothing right. like sunset and wine. Okay, two more. Uh, what are your hobbies outside of wine? I have a huge passion for photography. I, I love photography, yeah. and uh, I I have a hand in running the the social media pages for William Sullivan, which. It's a great excuse for me to bring out my camera from time to time. Um, anything, anything kind of artsy. I love painting. I love uh, spending time outdoors. All the, all the things that. Oh, and of course, food. That's my other hobby. Yeah. Being a big fan of wine. Obviously, food goes hand in hand with that. So, cooking and enjoying the food, both very much hobbies of mine. All right, last one. What is the last show that you binge watched? <laughs> I am currently binge watching a show by the name of Younger. It is, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar, it's, I've heard it called wow. the, the Sex in the City of the Millennial Generation. Okay. It's about a woman who wants to go into publishing and can't because of her age and kind of ends up in, in a crew of 20 somethings as she's a 40 year old trying to get back into the, to publishing. Great show if anyone has not seen it. Very, very okay. happy go lucky and fun show. They also drink really great wine on that show. I've noticed uh, the, some of the bottle shots that they see some, there's some good wine. Unfortunately, no William Selium yet, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe after this Not webinar yet. goes viral, they'll 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 pick it up. Um, I want to ask Jeff a question and ask a uh, answer a couple of questions from the chat. Um, uh, we are using our burgundy glasses on this. Someone asked, uh, uh, "Do we use cab glasses?" and um, we do taste this wine occasionally at the winery when people come and we do use our burgundy glasses here. Um, and that's quite honestly, since we don't open too many of these bottles here at the winery, it's just a practical thing. I actually, at, at home, I do have different Cabernet or Bordeaux uh, glasses and I do Pinot Noir glasses. Um, I think a burgundy glass does just fine with this, yeah. um, but uh, uh, I, I think you know if you if you like different glasses, uh, you can find a reason to bust out the uh, the, the Bordeaux stems. And then uh, one other question before I throw it back to Jeff. Uh, somebody asked if uh, you know who are we trying to compete with, and named a couple of Napa wines. Um, we really like to stand up to Bordeaux, is what we see as our competition. 
Um, much like within Pinot Noir, we compare ourselves to the top Burgundies. Uh, I don't think you would necessarily confuse us with Bordeaux, but I think that would be the competitive set that we would look to. We are always trying to raise the bar as high as possible, and we think that's the bar we want to go for. Um, so with that, uh, I'll throw it back to Jeff. Jeff, could you talk a little bit about the aging of the wines before you get into the 17? Yeah, sure. Um, it's always a difficult question to answer, I mean, as far as ageability, because I think the right time to open a, a bottle is the right time. I mean, in fact, I mean, uh, the, the 2018, which was brand new release, super young wine, um, tasted it with uh, John Dyson at, at dinner a couple of nights ago when we both had this amazing steak at, at Villette uh, in Healdsburg, and the wine was absolutely perfect with it, right? It was a young wine, but the, the fattiness and the richness of the wine can, you know, sort of ha uh, handle a, a very youthful uh, uh, wine. Um, so, you know, perfectly fine to drink it young with the right situation or, or a decant or, or what have you. Uh, but I believe these wines can go, I mean, there's sound acidity in the wines, uh, great tannin structure, um, you know, high quality winemaking technique that goes into it, very thoughtful um, premium barrels that go into it. So uh, I think it's got all the, the the pieces to be able to to go 20 years if, if you want. Um, with that said, I don't think you need to because you know, we've already done a great job in the in the winemaking process and the extraction, um, you know, the prop, what I would deem the, you know, the pr proper extraction uh, for the for the style that we're going for. So, you know, I, I think it's it's not unreasonable for for that, pri you know, that primary fruit sort of character to to diminish with even a few more years. So, you know, it's not wrong to to, to hold on to these bottles for five, seven years and, and really start to enjoy them at that point. Um, so I think that's, uh, but at the end of the day, you're the boss, you, you, you get to decide when you, when you open these wines, but, uh, just know, you know, um, the right food might be required or, or a little bit of decanting. So, um, and personally, I look forward to, to being able to try these wines in 10, 15 years, uh, myself. Um, okay, let's move on to the, to the 17, um, 17 was a really interesting year, um, it was a very wet year, um, lots of rainfall. I mean, we had record rain uh, in both valleys. Um, plants were super happy throughout the growing season. Um, and, you know, setting up for, you know, as we got closer into the harvest, it was a modest set, uh, a fruit set. Um, and as we kind of got into, obviously, 17 around here is very um, uh, well known for uh, the Tubbs fire. Um, as we got closer to um, uh, Labor Day, it was starting to build in heat. And that really kind of pushed the phenological sort of state of the plants. And, you know, I started picking actually the very first grapes for Cabernet on George and looking at my notes uh, was September 12th is when we started harvest, um, which is amazing. Um, a lot of heat units kind of built into the early half of, of September. And that's, you know, Cabernet does need heat in order to fully ripen, right? So that's why you see it in Napa, not as much in Russian River. I mean, there's great Cabernet that's grown in Sonoma as well, uh, but it needs heat units. Uh, and that really kind of pushed it to, to the to the point of like, wow, everything was was super ready. We continued to uh, harvest uh, through the end of September. Um, and then the Tubbs fire started on, um, my note is looking down, it was early, uh, early October, it was about the 8th of October. Um, I picked my last set of grapes on the, the 9th, um, uh, the, the 9th of, um, October, so the day after the the Tubbs fire started, uh, there was no issue with the grapes whatsoever because um, the smoke hadn't settled uh, in the valley at that point. Um, main difference with the sixteen and to the seventeen is started to get a few more blocks, uh, different blocks, different soil types, different clones, um, and you know what I talked about earlier as far as having different clonal material or different flavor profiles within the same vineyard to make something even more interesting and complex. 
Um, that started in 17. 2016 was a single block uh, of a few tons of grapes that, that, that we started with. Highly successful, but um, 17 was definitely starting to add additional layers. And I think you can taste that in the wines, right, guys? I mean, we, we opened these a few hours ago. Um, super interesting. More flavor, uh, you know, more layers. What do you what do you think, Carly? It's pretty different. It's, yeah, there's there's definitely more of a brightness, I think, on this this one compared to the 2016, at least. I think the 2016 had more. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, cocoa nibs is what I got mm -hmm. on the the 16. I love how bright and just I don't know, just it, there's a it's stunning. It's a stunning wine. I I definitely, love the. Definitely has still has that sort of red fruit quality, which I kind of look for in George. It's yeah, that bright yeah. red fruit that I think is is yeah. just that really sets it out, sets it off. The the thing that I'm trying to focus on is with each subsequent vintage, trying the 16, 17, and 18, I feel like it gets a, uh, a it's a little more concentrated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's also a year's age of difference. So the 16 is tasting amazing right now. Yeah. It, so I'm not sure if it's a function of age or a function of what you're doing, Jeff. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit of both um, for sure. I mean, some of the blocks that we picked up in 17 that we're continuing to source from uh, today um, definitely have a bit more structure to them. They have, they're in different parts of the vineyard where the soil is a little, you know, weaker, if you will. So there's definitely more concentration in the grapes. Um, you know, I think the nature of 17 vintage as well, I think there's a little bit brighter acidity, you know, not sourness, but definitely a brighter kind of quality. So, um, you know, I think that's kind of playing on the tannins a little bit more and quantitatively for sure, the 17 has a, has a little bit more acidity to it. So I think it's partly the season and partly maybe some of these other blocks. So, uh, but definitely age is, you know, the 16 is definitely tasting nice because of a tiny little bit more age. So yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Nice. Yeah. Um, didn't really change much from a winemaking perspective, if anything, um, you know, we probably did a few more pump overs, uh, you know, I think in 16, not really knowing how the wine was going to react. We did some, but not as many. And so in 17, you know, maybe we did a few more, uh, but everything was still done in the dairy tank still with, with our, just like with our Pinot Noirs, um, uh, William Selium yeast and all, you know, all the just scratch out Pinot Noir and the insert of our protocol and insert Cabernet. And it's really, that, that's really the, um, you know, how we make the wine. Um, cold, you know, one thing I forgot to mention earlier too is, you know, Pinot Noir, we do a cold soak. We, we do a cold soak with the Cabernet. Uh, I don't actually know if that's typical with, with other houses, but uh, the cold soaking helps, you know, start to break down the grapes. You're starting to get a little bit of um, sort of passive extraction during the cold soaking. Um, and yeah, that kind of retains some of the fruitiness, I think in the wine as well. Um, so yeah, super delicious. Uh, 18, I'm super excited about. It has um, same grape sourcing. We actually added one additional uh, block, uh, block F at George, um, that I'm really excited about. Um, it's, we only get about a 0.8 tons of it. Um, but it's on a really gravelly part. It's a very tannic um, uh, um, section of the ranch, um, but it really did height, you know, increase the level of concentration in the wine even more. The 18 is obviously very youthful, uh, but I'm really pleased with how this wine's developing. Um, needs definitely a few years, but. Um, it's interesting when, you know, we're commenting offline in the beginning, just there is a commonality with all these wines. There's definitely a, you know, vintage difference, but the, the site has a real signature. I mean, it's got, you know, again, that sort of red fruit, a little bit of that earthiness um, and, you know, fresh acidity, uh, very wonderful site, I think, to have started 
the William Salyum Cabernet program uh, off with because it, I think there's a, a nice synergy with with our technique and, and the site. Um, what do you guys think of the 18, Mark? I, you know, it's it's got that concentration that I was talking about and it still has the red fruit nature to it. There's just more of it, mm -hmm. um, which is hard to describe. I have to, I have to say that, um, you know, I'm not, it's been a long time since I've really focused on a Cabernet tasting, tasted multiple vintages, and it's totally different than Pinot Noir. And the thing that stands out to me about the 18 is even though it has this rich concentration, I associate cab tannin of the chalkiness on the sides of your cheeks. Yeah. And this has a ton of structure to it, but I don't get any of that on it. And yeah. which makes me like it a lot more. So yeah. I, I think it's a, uh, it's a fabulous expression and I really want to try it with food because yeah. that I think will make these wines show a, a com in a completely different light. So I, I, I already said, I'm going to try to steal a little bit of this and try it with dinner tonight and see how it changes with the food. Yeah, no, absolutely. What about you? Colleen? Do you have any comments on the, on the 18? I like that this is slightly, it feels a little bit more, again, that red fruit is very present, but there's, yeah. there's kind of a brambliness to this wine that I, I didn't quite notice in the other two that I think is, yeah. is really interesting as well. It's kind of, well, and, and we're kind of building up to, I mean, 2018 was a pretty spectacular growing season. And those of you that you know, I saw a few comments, uh, drinking some 18s and, and so forth. I think our 18 Pinot Noirs in Sonoma, you know, in the Russian River, uh, all in Sonoma County and up and down California, it was a awesome vintage. I mean, very good growing season, just a modest amount of, uh, of rain, um, or I should say the right amount of rain uh, and slightly on the cooler side. And it just let grapes, you know, come to full expression. Uh, so I think we're also tasting, you know, that concentration, the the structure of the wine is kind of a bit of a signature of the 18 vintage. And, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for people to uh, those of you that were able to buy a few bottles to, to taste it in a few years. And, and hopefully you'll share the same uh, uh, excitement that I do about this wine, because I think it's a, a wonderful expression of what we can do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to hit a couple of questions, this is in a typical Bordeaux bottle. Um, yeah. It is 100 percent Cabernet. Well, obviously, Bordeaux is generally a blend with four to five grapes, Cabernet Franc, um, uh, Carmen Merlot, Merlot Carmenere. This is uh, this is 100 percent Cabernet. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, Jeff, someone asked uh, what what Bordeaux specifically would you want to emulate? I'm paraphrasing, but yeah, you know, yeah. You're gonna well, hold it's interesting. Up. Every time I taste this wine with uh, uh, with John Dyson, uh, he always remarks that it's a dead ringer for uh, a Pichon Lalonde, which is a um, a Poyac, so left bank Cabernet based sort of wine. It's got red fruits and the tobacco and the cedar box, that kind of thing. So. All those elements are there and you know he's definitely it has that that sort of characteristic um but yeah i mean any of the great houses you know i remember as uh, being wowed by vintages of lynch Baj and pichon baron and all these wonderful you know sort of poyak producers it, it definitely has that sort of um you know vein running through it so yeah and the right bank is more Merlot based. So those are wines are very different, more berry fruit and, you know, very different in style. So definitely a left bank, you know, even more specifically kind of like Poyak. Nice. Nice. And, um, and Larry, uh, I, I'm not sure what I'm going to make for dinner, but if I have some of this cab, it's probably changing what I'm making. <laughs> so big steak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So Carly, did you see any other questions on there that we should uh, hit? Uh, I am looking. Well, you oh, look, um, I will give you kind of a, a future looking peek. So um, we are 
Uh, we're going to continue to make cab. We've definitely found a great partnership with um, the Beck Stoffers. And in 2019, we're going to introduce a second Pinot Noir, uh, Pinot Noir, Cabernet. Um, you can tell that I talk Pinot Noir all day um, from the Missouri Hopper Vineyard. Um, so in 19, we'll have two. And in 20, we are one of the few um, producers because of our early picking that were, was, we were able to pick some of the fruit from the Beckstar for Tokalon Vineyard in 20. So in 2023, we'll actually have three Cabernet Sauvignons, uh, which uh, that's, that's as far as we're going so far, but there are more Cabernets uh, to share with you in the future. Uh, kind of like what we do with the great vineyards here, we're just trying to replicate it in um, Napa Valley. And quite honestly, we're just having fun with it. And so we like drinking different wines. And so it's great for us to try these uh, three different vineyards from the Beck Stoffers. So stay tuned for that, more interesting stuff coming. And then uh, let me kick it back to you, Carly. Hello again. Uh, so if we didn't get to anyone's questions during the webinar, you're always more than welcome to. I know uh, some of my colleagues in the chat box uh, have responded back to a few of them, but um, we also mentioned if you have any questions or are interested in more information about the Cabernet, um, if you have any questions we didn't answer, you're always more than welcome to reach out to us. Uh, and I'll repeat that up here as well. It's tours at williamsellium.com, T-O-U-R-S at williamscellium.com. So if you need anything in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and I think on, on that note, unless you lovely gentlemen have anything else to share. One thing I wanted to add, just sort of piggyback on Mark's uh, about the, the sneak peek. Um, the Missouri Hopper is a really five, if folks are not, and these are all Beckstoffer uh, vineyards, um, I'm super excited about the 19 um, Missouri Hopper. Um, that vineyard, if you're not familiar with where it is, it's in Oakville, but it's on sort of the border of Oakville and um, and Yountville on the west side. So it's kind of in the foothill. Uh, historic vineyard, uh, old vines. Um, when you see this wine, it's it it, it has a it, it it's nearly opaque. It's so concentrated uh, for whatever reason. It sits in a bit of a windy spot in, in the valley, um, you know, kind of in the southern part of, of Oakville. And um, I, I'm really excited to show it to, to everybody in the future. I, Mark, I don't even know if you've tasted it uh, in, you know, during blending and, and so forth, but um, it's, uh, it's going to wow you uh, for sure. Um, and then uh, enough said about, you know, there's not enough said about Tokelon. I mean, it's just an amazing vineyard. So yeah, I mean, we have three very distinctive terroirs, three different flavor profiles, um, you know, much like with our Pinot Noir sets, you know, different vineyards, different flavors, different regions. Um, is, this is a wonderful study in what Cabernet can do because these, these three wines are so unique and different. So um, very much in line with what we do at William Selium. So um, stay tuned. And if you get offered some bottles, definitely jump on them because there's not, there's actually not that much of the Missouri hopper nor the Tokalon in the, in the future, but um, yeah. All right. And I want to hit a couple last questions, uh, non Cabernet related questions. Um, uh, there was a question about, will we be doing um, fall pickup weekend, both here and in Millbrook? Um, you know, certainly we'll at a minimum be doing uh, in Millbrook what we've done this past year, which is kind of seated tastings. Um, for going beyond that, we're just going to have to see. Um, we, we may be technically capable of doing a pickup weekend, but that doesn't mean we necessarily should because that is quite a large event here in California. So we're going to play it by year. At some point, logistically, we're going to have to make a decision months before we would hold the event. And so we're just going to keep watching it. And, you know, June 15th here in California, things are going to change dramatically. And we have to see where things go from there. So um, stay tuned. What I can say is um, if for some reason we're not doing pickup weekends um, this fall here, 
we will certainly be eyeing um, spring of next year to get back into it because we miss seeing you guys, um, sharing the wines with you, and uh, look forward to seeing you in person. And of course, we are open for tours and tastings. Same address that Carly gave out if you're in the area. Um, we are filling up really fast. There's a huge demand right now. Who, who can imagine after being cooped up for a year that people want to get out? Um, so <laughs> try to book in advance, but uh, come and see us. We'd love to see you all. Cheers, everybody. Cheers to you all. Cheers. Enjoy. I'm going to keep drinking.